Welcome, everybody. This is Forum 8. You know, we have 10 candidates for the Palo Alto City Council, and one of them is with us tonight, Pat Burt, pardon me, but we only have two more forums, and then we've heard all the candidates. I hope you haven't made your mind up yet because the last two forums are gonna be very interesting. And I have a feeling this forum also is going to be really interesting. Let me introduce our wonderful moderator, Jeanette Keesley. Thank you so much, Freda. <laughs> thank you very much and welcome everyone. Um, thank you very much, Pat Bird, for being here tonight. I know you had um, another um, uh, forum to go to just ahead of us. So um, very, very happy you're here and you're certainly a total pro. You were there right on the dot um, as we were discussing, oh my God, what are we going to do if he's not going to be there? Um, so welcome. Uh, the way we run this forum is that um, we mute everyone throughout the forum and you please ask your questions in the chat function. Send me your questions and I'll pose them to Pat. And um, the way we start is usually with a little introduction. Um, I don't think, Pat, we need to introduce you much because a lot of people already know you. You've been here in Palo Alto for 40 years. You worked in tech, duh, like so many other people, um, as the CEO of a company. And um, you already served two terms on city council and you were the mayor in 2010 and 2016. You have a reputation as a political pragmatist and a policy centrist who is capable of building consensus. Your achievements on city council are, as you list them yourself, enacting a pension reform, launching an infrastructure master plan that funded more than 300 million in capital investment, modernizing the 911 communications while reducing costs and investing in a citywide bike network. Before you were in the city council, you were on the planning and transportation commission for nine years. And you are, as you post on your website, a regional state and national environmental leader, having served on numerous environmental committees. My impression, Pat, is that you are motivated to run for office again because you seem to not be very happy with the current city council's work. Is my impression correct? And if so, what are your major criticism? And with that, I'd like to hand over to you to introduce yourself a little bit more to us and maybe also answer the question I just posed. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thanks for the um, hosting this gathering. And um, so first, before wading into that question of why I'm running, um, as um, Jeanette mentioned, uh, my wife Sally and I have lived here for 40 years. Um, I grew up here in, in Santa Clara Valley. Um, both my parents were teachers, grew up mostly in Sunnyvale. And, uh, but my mother had lived here during the 1940s and uh, of all the places she lived, uh, Palo Alto was her favorite. We couldn't afford as a family to live here, but she instructed my wife and me if there was any way we could get a foothold in Palo Alto to do so. Um, and we've never looked back at that. Um, uh, you know, we're an imperfect community, but it really is a wonderful community at the same time. And um, our imperfections give us uh, opportunities for how to become better yet. So uh, my reasons for running for council it, in, in large part are really the same reasons why I've been serving for 25 years. I was leader of the University South Neighborhoods Group when we launched the SOFA South of Forest Coordinated Area Plan, which redeveloped the whole area uh, that was formerly the Palo Alto Medical Foundation site. We created a, uh, with the city, the city, we lobbied them and they empowered us uh, to create a uh, multi-stakeholder group with representatives from the neighborhood and business interests and transportation and affordable housing experts. And we spent two years hammering through and came up with a consensus solution that was far better than anyone thought we could develop going in. And I, I reference that because uh, that really has parallels to what we uh, have attempted to do 
with the rail grade separations and what maybe we can still pull together on it. Uh, so my reasons for running are uh, then there is a lot of uh, additional work and direction that I really think the city needs to do. Uh, we need to establish ourselves on a sustainable path of balancing our high-tech job growth with at least as much housing as we have in offices and to moderate the amount of office growth and increase the amount of housing growth in all types. At the same time, we have to have the investments in transportation and our other civic services that go along with those uh, additional people who are expected to be in this community and even more if the uh, likely mandates from the regional governments uh, insist upon very rapid uh, housing growth in our community. So having a vision of what is sustainable is part of my background. I was vice chair of sustainable San Mateo County and that whole uh, concept is how do you have growth at a pace and of a type that allows for future generations to have comparable opportunities economically, with social equity, and environmentally. And that's a challenge. Uh, but if we have that as guiding principles, uh, that really becomes uh, a great deal of what we do. Second, I've been uh, very committed to environmental issues and was uh, very active in, in Palo Alto, advancing in those arenas, uh, not merely moving toward a recycled water supply and, and, um, and uh, our natural habitat preservation, but our climate change one, which um, since I've gone off the council, the scientific community has really told us that if anything, they're underestimating the pace of climate change and the urgency is even greater. And unfortunately, we had made incredible pro progress uh, in the years I was on the council to be one of the first cities globally to have 100% carbon neutral electricity. And we did it at a cost of one third lower than PG&E. Um, but since I left the council, we've frankly made only a, a small amount of progress and we have to be recommitted for that. But finally is um, uh, really the, the how to make the council more effective. And uh, uh, one part of that, as I mentioned, I believe strongly in the empowerment of uh, embracing residents and the business interests in the community to bring them together in, in collaborative problem solving. And done correctly, it can have really good consensus results that allow us to move forward as opposed to having divisions at, uh, at, based on decisions and then they get reversed or we have uh, erratic progress. Um, so I'm a big believer in that, that type of process. Uh, and, uh, and now we have this great challenge of the pandemic and the ensuing economic crisis for the city where our services have, the council narrowly decided to drastically cut our services in a year where we had um, a huge loss, mostly in our hotel revenue and that revenue was dedicated to a big infrastructure plan that I had been very involved with creating. We had a $41 million deficit. They cut $2 million out of a $179 million infrastructure plan for this year, all time record, and cut $39 million from services. And uh, we need to put people first in a crisis like this. We will continue with that infrastructure plan, but we just need to moderate its rate and retain vital fire services, emergency preparedness services, libraries and parks. They even had proposed, we successfully pushed back, but to slash every single, eliminate every teen program in the city while our teens are housebound and stressed and losing a year of their lives. I think it's a real misguided set of proposals. Unfortunately, this all came from the city manager and city staff who have really in recent years taken on a role of setting or uh, framing policies for the council and really almost predetermining many of those policies and the council largely ratifying or changing on the margins. The role of the council is to set policy, determine policies, to have the vision for the future. That's not the staff role. And the role of the council is also to oversee the staff. So those are the reasons that I'm 
wanting to run again and serve our community and serve you. And I look forward to speaking with you. Thanks. Oh, we're not hearing Jeanette. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so thank you very much for the introduction. It looks to me like you wouldn't obviously have voted for this huge budget cut. What would you have done instead? So out of that 179 million um, capital budget, I would have pushed out just a portion of those projects. And that's all it would take to preserve the vast majority of the services that were cut. Uh, we have some that we can simply slow down, um, like our new police building. Uh, interestingly, the, the, the estimated cost of that had gone up 30% in the last three years. And that's because in the booming tech economy, all the costs and bids were going through the roof. We've seen the same thing when I uh, was uh, deeply involved with our recovery from the Great Recession. When the downturn hits, the cost of these public projects goes down. And we're already seeing 10% below estimates on certain projects already. So by pushing it out, not only do we uh, allow ourselves to retain our services through the next two years, which is kind of the time horizon that we think we're going to have our tightest belts, uh, but we'll actually save money. Rather than build these things on inflated costs, we'll build them when they're reduced. Let me pick up a question uh, from Sophie Tsang, which actually goes in the same direction as my next question. Um, she wants to know what is your most urgent issue? And I want to tie that into what is your idea to get Palo Alto out of this economically very difficult impact pandemic? And remind me of the question. I got distracted there. Yeah, sorry. So Sophie Tsen wanted to know what your most urgent issue is. And I, I tie that into the, the economic side of this question, namely, how would you get Palo Alto out of this economically very difficult impact of the pandemic? Well, it's beyond the city to get us out of the pandemic. Um, well, there are a number of things that we can do to um, contend with this more effectively. So part of it is maintaining those services. We need, as we've seen, after I fought against cutbacks in the fire and the Office of Emergency, Emergency Services, what have we had in the recent weeks is this incredible fourth year in a row of horrendous fires that were even a threat to our Foothills residents. We cannot cut our fire department at that time and we can't cut our offers of emergency services. Um, and so uh, what I would do is uh, restore the bulk of those service cuts and slow down uh, the rest of the uh, infrastructure. But in addition to that, there are a whole bunch of things that are now needs that have arisen as a result of the pandemic. And the city has limited resources to contend with this. It's one of the things that um, those of us who have been involved in emergency preparation, which was my one of my portfolios on the council, is we knew when the big one hit, whether it's a quake or whatever, there would not be enough um, city staff to be able to contend with all of the needs. And that's the same thing here. And unfortunately, we kind of have a mindset of now our, our city manager leadership that only city staff can really meet our needs. And what the additional role that the city can do is to really be the facilitator and convener and bringing together nonprofits, the business community, and uh, individuals in the community to address a whole bunch of emergency needs, to identify them and address them. And together, uh, we can leverage resources drastically, and we've done that, and that's how really a lot of the greatest things about Palo Alto have occurred is from leveraging those resources rather than just thinking that it had to be the paid bureaucracy to provide those. So that's, I actually co-authored a four page memo to the council initially in late February before the first cases hit that said, look, we are likely to have an avalanche of a pandemic coming. And then uh, we held off on that. They asked that uh, not go public until uh, they get a chance to contend with it. So in mid-March, um, I had five former mayors and other uh, five other uh, community leaders co-sign this. And it really laid out a whole bunch of potential things that we were facing, including the impacts of a declaration of a state of emergency. 
which the council did on March 17th. They, one of the points we made is that that is an extraordinary measure. We are still under a state of emergency and under that legally, great powers go to the city manager that he does not normally have and to the city council. And the argument we made was the city attorney needed to explain to the council fully and to the community, what were those extraordinary powers? And they still have not done this. It's just remarkable. None of us here on this call probably know the full extent of the unusual powers that are not, they're extraordinary governmental powers. One of them was uh, an ability to declare a curfew. Well, they all said, well, that's kind of irrelevant. And next thing we had was a declaration of curfew that was claimed to be legally based on the health pandemic, the health emergency, which we had declared, but it was to respond to uh, a civil unrest perception and a potential organized crime um, uh, action in our downtown Stanford Shopping Center. So it was even legally dubious uh, that uh, that was allowed to do so. We had a 10 day citywide state of emergency because of a perceived threat. And nobody knew what was going on and the city attorney didn't even sign off on this. So I think there are some real problems. Uh, part of it is that we have a council that is perhaps in general has less institutional knowledge and experience than many of our councils in the past. And that's one of the things that I think I'd be able to help uh, my colleagues with uh, is knowing what their authority, how to exercise the authority that they'd like to be able to exercise. It sounds like the question, uh, the answer to a question that we had on many of these forums, namely who is running the city, the city manager or the city council. Um, so can you give us like a more clear yeah. answer to that? What do you think? Well, there's always some tension in that. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the council has the, the responsibility under the charter to set policies and to oversee, but not manage the city administration. And in my mind, and I think uh, I'm not alone, uh, what we've seen the last three plus years, especially the last two years with this new city manager, uh, is uh, a, a successful attempt to really drive a determination of policies uh, based on staff priorities and st staff vision of what policies ought to be. And then the council is left with trying to resist staff. That's not the proper role. And um, so I do believe that, that the, um, the proper balance of power has shifted inappropriately and that we have to readjust that. Okay, let me just uh, finish this group of question with um, uh, the question about a business tax that also came up in many forms before. You led a citizens group supporting a fair business tax. I think you called it the business license tax to fund traffic relief, affordable housing, train separations, and retaining city services during the current budget debate. Can you elaborate on that? Can you tell us more about what you have in mind? Yes. So uh, this, when I was, uh, my second term as mayor in 2016, we were also negotiating with um, the county on the measure B, VTA measure, and uh, I led those negotiations and we were able to successfully uh, get allocated uh, th over $300 million toward our grade separations. And we never had any money to begin that process. And so that was more than anyone thought would be possible. It was a tough negotiation. At that time, I also uh, appointed a, a council committee to explore a business tax to address our transportation and affordable housing needs. Um, it was uh, somewhat of a rush process. It was a little bit of a leverage to be able to get the dollars we wanted from the VTA because if we put that on the ballot, it might have competed with Measure B. Uh, and so in the end, uh, for a combination of reasons, uh, we agreed to not move forward on the 2016 ballot and we had a unanimous 9-0 city council agreement to take it up in a, in a more thoughtful way in early 2017. The Chamber of Commerce had argued, we're not against it necessarily, we just wanted to go through a normal Palo Alto process and have good deliberations and a good design. And there was merit to that. In 2017, we had uh, this new, uh, more pro-development majority in the council come in and they reversed that decision and they shelved it. 
Um, and then, uh, so a number of us began to do research and what we really found was uh, that we were even more of an outlier than we thought. Um, Palo Alto is one of the few cities in the state without a business tax, but Silicon Valley in general is an exceptionally low business tax region, despite having now the most wealthy companies in the world. Uh, we are an exceptionally low business tax region. Silicon Valley on the, I mean, Palo Alto has nothing, but on the average Silicon Valley has 5% the tax rate on business as San Francisco. And yet Palo Alto competes in essence with San Francisco for many of these companies. So there is a great deal of opportunity for having those big businesses pay for the impacts that they're creating and succeeding from. Um, so the council, uh, we had a number of council members who took this forward, uh, Lydia Koo and Tom Du Bois took it to the council. It was moving forward. Um, half of the council or more either uh, didn't want any tax. Uh, Greg Tanaka and Liz Niss uh, opposed all business tax. And the other uh, three others wanted uh, a, a light version. And we only had uh, a few council members who uh, really were looking at the scale comparable to what East Palo Alto has today. That's all we're talking about. It's really amazing. And there were arguments that, oh, if you impose this, uh, no new development will happen. Well, after East Palo Alto adopted a 20 cents a square foot on office, and their, the office developers threatened that nothing would ever happen in East Palo Alto again, three huge projects came forward immediately after the election. They cried wolf. Um, so when the pandemic and the recession hit, uh, it was really clear uh, to me and others that unfortunately this is the wrong time to move forward on a business tax. And we supported putting it on the shelf until we begin our recovery. Uh, and so that's where it stands now, but it's really important for funding whatever we want on grade separations and funding the transportation elements that we, we really all need as we return to normal and funding the affordable housing. So if we split that three ways, just that one third for affordable housing would triple the funding we have for affordable housing. It would really have an impact. We get to affordable housing and the great separation in a minute. I just want to consider one more question from um, Rachel Kellerman. And Rachel, I asked you to be a little bit more specific about your question, if you could just write that in the chat. Um, but she would like to know, how should the council over the course of the next two terms develop a downtown plan? I don't know if you know what aspect she would like to know, but that's what I, I asked her to hear about the aspect. Well, she may be referring to um, what the council has tentatively talked about doing is a, a, a comprehensive plan for the greater downtown area that would include consideration of what to do in the, um, with the grade related issues. And I call it that because it includes uh, the whole intermodal transportation center, our train station, which is not just a train station. I'd, I'd let anybody write down on a card how many bus uh, uh, buses are uh, arrive and depart there each day. And I was so shocked when I heard this number, I asked staff to double check it several years ago. 900, it's just phenomenal. It's a real intermodal transportation center, uh, the busiest in the region. And so when we look at what to do, you know, they were talking of the council has gone kind of erratically on this grade separation issue. Um, uh, but they basically um, really realized that they needed to look at what was going to happen at Palo Alto Avenue and University Avenue as kind of a set along with related downtown development around those stations. So I think that's probably what Rachel is doing. And the coordinated area plan process needs to be well designed and well run, uh, which means that it's, it's, we have in transportation what's called context sensitive solutions. It's the transportation version of this. It's what we were committed to do on the grade separations in the city for um, a half a dozen years. And the council then rescinded that when they began this process. Uh, Nadia and I worked hard to try to get them to adopt it. They ended up kind of doing a, a CSS light uh, is what we have today. So Rachel uh, wrote, Pat is correct. When the council decided not to deal with Palo Alto Avenue crossing, they they pondered the decision to a downtown plan. We 
we wanted to know what is happening with that idea. So as of right now, nothing is happening. Uh, it was going to be the, uh, at some point in the next few years after we got settlement on designs for the other grade crossings. And now with the, the, with the economic crisis, what was driving the need for the grade separations and really the urgency was a combination of pending significant increase in the number of trains per hour from five to six maximum at peak hour going to eight and eventually 10 in each direction, which would basically make the at-grade crossings unfunctional and projection at the same time that the traffic that needs to cross would be going up. And that's what we had an urgency. How do we get this done um, uh, before those things happen to us? So if we're out of sequence and, and the greater impacts happen before we have the grade separations, what do we do then? Now we've got this pushed out. We all know that Caltrain is basically on hold. They're running ghost trains with a few passengers. Um, but more importantly, the whole regional economy not only will have a number of years before it gets back as healthy as it was at the peak of the boom period, but it actually would have to go to the next step to need that next level of train service, exceed where we left off, before we really have to have the grade separations. So it gives us now reasonable breathing room. The urgency that was feeling many on staff thought was a crisis and they had to shortcut the process because in 2017 they said, we have to have a decision by early 2018. Greg Scharf and others insisted this was the case. And I said, this is, I was out of office, but Nadia and I had been in this so much that we said, you don't understand, this is a hard problem to solve and especially Churchill, because it's such a constrained right-of-way. It's the narrowest right-of-way in the whole length from San Francisco to San Jose, and we have housing on both sides and Alma on another, and trying to fit a solution in there is, from an engineering design standpoint, really difficult. Um, so we knew that we'd have to look at ramifications on traffic overflow in other places, and it would have to be looked at cohesively, and it would not be easy, and it couldn't be rushed in six months and they discovered it. They fired the first consulting group, didn't even build off of what they had done, and then uh, put uh, what was a cap, which was only a citizen's group to advise on communications. They had no responsibility or authority on recommending design alternatives, and then they morphed that into the X cap, but unfortunately, they didn't, they didn't build it in with needing all the stakeholders there that really should be there of having, we need Stanford there. We need to have the business community there, we need the school district there, and we need other representation. And unfortunately, we, we, we have a, a, a shrunk group, and a couple of the folks are actually directly impacted personally, which is an important perspective, but they're not, that's not, that's a conflict of interest that shouldn't be part of that group. It should be heard from and valued and appreciated. But um, this design of the, the process is better than what they had, and it's not ideal. Um, so that's what we've got to do and correct going forward. But now we've got some breathing room. And of course, you went right into the hottest issue down here in Southgate. Um, you I guys hear about that? <laughs> yeah, we heard about it. Why did tell me? Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> here or there. Um, so let me just jump into some questions that came up uh, even before you started talking about it. So some of the, the questions you might have already answered. but. Abby Bradsky would like to know, would you talk about what you think about the Churchill train crossing, which actually means obviously specifically what you mean, what, do you, what is your opinion about the, the crossing, should it be closed or not? Um, do you like either of the recommendations still on the table? Is there another direction you could see us taking? And I guess that indicates what you just said, um, or that picks up what you just said, that we might have some breathing room or we might not have to make that decision now. Let, let's take that question yeah. first, and then I have a couple of others that probably will follow up on it. So it's interesting, having been kind of the, the rail guy on the council for a long time, everybody keeps going, so what's your pre preferred alternative? And over the previous several years, I said, it's premature. I want to understand the implications more. We've now narrowed it down quite a bit. And interestingly, there's another city staff and consultant issue. They were adamant that there were no other real alternatives to be considered at Charleston East Meadow or Churchill beyond the set that they had come up with. 
uh, the hybrid undercrossing, the, the um, viaduct, uh, the trench or tunnel, that there were no other possibilities. And after Nadia and others successfully battled to be allowed to ask the community for their concepts, we got two really intriguing ones. Uh, one for the Charleston East Meadow that you may be familiar with, but on the Churchill, we got the uh, uh, modified underpass or modified closure, however we want to describe it. And then we had, we still had the viaduct on the table and we had the closure. Um, so they removed the viaduct recently. It was, it, that was kind of implied. I'm very intrigued by the partial underpass. Um, but unfortunately, it's been vetted from an engineering and design standpoint less well than some of the other alternatives. And we can't get answers on some key things from Caltrain until they begin a process the start of the year and they need some answers from high-speed rail to boot. So we can only take it so far. I will say that, that that's the most intriguing alternative to me. Um, and we'll see what happens on um, the, uh, the closure option. We had one transportation study that basically indicated they thought that the transfer of all that traffic could move over mostly to Embarcadero and spread somewhat to the others and be mitigated. I was very surprised by that. And I remain somewhat skeptical that that's feasible. It's also the concept in the comprehensive plan that we want to increase the permeability in our community, not decrease it. And so um, I, I think that we, we don't want to also, there's, a, there's another transportation principle, which is induced demand. And that means that if you make something much better and add lanes or whatever, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem long-term, it attracts more people to come there and more cars. So we, one of the things about the partial underpass is that it would not create the induced demand. It would, um, uh, for the people on the east side of Alma, it would actually have less impact on their streets, but it wouldn't create a closed street. Um, and uh, it more has to be flushed out on it, including how to really contend effectively with the bike and pedestrian routes. Um, my wife and I bike as our primary means of transportation in the city and uh, getting safe and efficient uh, routes there would be a real asset. And that's what we need to do more of in the city where we really have um, uh, effective alternatives for people that are attractive and fast uh, so they don't necessarily uh, need to get in their car unless they want to. Um, so I, bottom line is um, uh, we still need more info. I remain, I'm, the most intriguing one to me is the partial underpass. So let me follow up with a question from Susan Newman and Eduardo Lach. Um, what about the argument that the city needs to make a decision soon in order to take advantage of the uh, 700 uh, dollar VTA funds? So it's 700 million for the eight grade crossings, yeah. currently eight grade crossings, although they're Mountain View is doing closing between Sunnyvale and Palo Alto. And I was the primary negotiator on that. So we get approximately half of that in theory. Uh, that was the argument that was made in 2017 that if we didn't have a decision by 2018, we'd lose those dollars. Well, we're 2020 uh, and they're not in jeopardy. Uh, we do need to proceed. Uh, so we can't shelve this. Uh, but part of the problem, too, is that with uh, Caltrain has said that based on their agreement with high-speed rail, they cannot eliminate the potential of a four-track system on the right-of-way until they go through this next step of the process and narrow down where they might need passing tracks. It's highly unlikely that they put the passing tracks at the narrowest right-of-way location at Churchill. Uh, but they still won't give us a, a clear answer. Staff has kind of said, well, because of that, we, we can't really proceed on the alternative of, um, of the partial underpass because it has a slight encroachment on the right-of-way. Um, so that's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. Um, so, and then right now, we're in the middle of a declared emergency. So the, the decision remains a priority and we can't shell this but the urgency is not there. And Caltrain's schedule of uh, their expansion is probably pushed out at least five years from what we were calculating. On top of that, that's those dollars from the Measure B fund, um, first they were held up because there was a lawsuit on that. That just held up a couple of years. 
and uh, didn't affect the funds. But those funds are now being drastically impacted by the downturn. They're sales tax funds. And sales tax has gone through the floor. So they don't have the dollars um, at the front end of that 30-year 30 30 year period that they thought. Over the course of the 30-year period of the tax, they'll, they'll get virtually all the dollars that they had hoped for. But right now, they don't have the money to give us uh, if we were ready, nor to, to give Mountain View or Sunnyvale, uh, who are further along than us. Um, Susan, I would like to um, actually unmute Eduardo Lapp, who posed a question earlier. I'd like him to um, ask him ask the question himself to you, because he can then adapt what he asked a little bit earlier, and some of it you probably already answered. Eduardo, would you like to ask your question to uh, Pat, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, really appreciate it. I think that um, the church will close closure is one option or the underpass. Thank God they've ducked this out of the question because I think it affects people really badly in Mariposa and Castaleja. But it's really one issue out of four, right? We have four at Great Crossings. We have seven altogether in Palo Alto. All of them, you know, 200 plus million dollars altogether. You indicated that the measure B might provide that. But how is the city as a whole thinking about doing that? Are you thinking it's just going to be measure B or how are you thinking in terms of how that whole plan of all seven crossings, mitigations, underpasses, et cetera, how are you thinking that that's going to be resolved? Are you suggesting that that's going to happen five to 10 years from now? So um, first from the funding availability standpoint, um, I viewed the Measure B dollars, the 300 million or so from that, as the major down payment. Um, and we don't know what percentage of the ultimate cost because it depends on which designs we go with. But if we ended up with designs uh, that are the tentatively preferred one for uh, Charleston East Meadow area, uh, maybe the, if we assume for a moment the uh, partial underpass for Churchill, and then something perhaps still needing to be done at Palo Alto Avenue or University, um, then each of those, the, the, the grand total of that, you know, it could be a billion dollars total. So we'd have uh, uh, 30% as kind of the down payment. So that's part of why the business tax is something I was very intrigued with. There would be, uh, the, the Measure B dollars are viewed as regional dollars, even though we pay into that tax. And uh, to get regional and state and federal dollars, you need a large local share. And that's what the business tax uh, was in large part uh, focused on. So we thought depending on uh, the, the scale of the business tax, if we, if we used half of it for grade crossings, a quarter for other transportation impacts and a quarter for the affordable housing, uh, then uh, our rough estimates were that when you bond that, so you take the annual revenue from that and you can borrow at about a 14 to one ratio, uh, then we might be looking at uh, in the neighborhood of $400 million we might be able to get. Maybe we round it down, who knows? It's not an exact number, but that's a big portion. And then we have three other funding sources, regional, state, and federal. There haven't been federal dollars since, um, since the Great Recession, but we could see, we've had all the talk, and we could very well see another major infrastructure funding. Uh, we have state dollars that are there now and have others that are coming up in recent years. The state has passed a number of measures to put significant dollars there. And then we have a regional measure that is called um, re, uh, the, what do they call it? The uh, name for it, super measure or something like that. But they're looking at $100 billion regionally for all transportation related issues over the next several decades. And so there's some big dollars. The other thing that's happened is that when we were working with Caltrain, Caltrain didn't have enough dollars to get electrification. They scraped it together and got the couple billion dollars they needed for electrification. Um, but when we said, well, if you're going to expand the number of trains as a result of electrification, obviously many, if not all of these grade, at grade crossings will either need to be closed or grade separated. Where are the dollars for that? They didn't want to discuss it because they just couldn't see where the dollars would come from. So they were kind of in this denial state. The good news is that's changed. Caltrain has come out with their business plan this last year, and a number of 
This is because we had a transformation in the board leadership of Caltrain uh, and people that Nadia and I had worked with closely and they did a great job and they have driven Caltrain to really have a serious plan. And part of that was, yes, ultimately, if we get up to eight or 10 trains per hour per direction, we're going to have to a grade separation, separate all of the crossings in the system. And uh, to do that, there's going to have to be funding. Caltrain doesn't have those dollars, but they recognize that the two are intrinsically linked and that they're going to work with the cities up and down the corridor and the regional bodies to get that. They're in the middle of this uh, super measure through uh, the MTC. Uh, and there were actually last week just battles on that. Sam McArdle wants more dollars for grade separation south of San Jose to bring high-speed rail into San Jose. And so this is dynamic right now. But that's one of the biggest potential and likeliest funding sources. Nothing's settled on the additional funding, but that's often the way these big projects happen. It's amazing that when they're designed, the funding's not there. It gets cobbled together over several years from a variety of sources. And once that recognition was made all the way up to the state rail plan level, that these are going to have to be grade separated, eventually they figure out how to do it. And so we'll have to have our share and uh, I think the other dollars will uh, be cobbled. I'll give you another little aside though. When Nadia and I met with this, um, he was then assistant city manager, but the, uh, now the city manager in 2018, pushing for this better process as a, a starting point and a precondition for a meeting, he said, I just want to make sure that everybody here agrees before we have any further discussions that there are going to be no additional dollars from outside of Palo Alto for grade crossings besides the Measure B dollars. And what was driving that is, therefore, we need the cheapest grade separations that are available. And um, we, we certainly, at a minimum, argued, just simply said, I don't agree and I'm not, I'm not accepting that as a precondition and here's the reasons why. And here are three or four potential funding sources. Amongst them, several are likely to happen and we don't think you're right and we don't think you know what you're, you're talking about. Now he's a big proponent of those very same funding sources. So, uh, you know, leading bureaucrats uh, don't necessarily have either the knowledge or the vision in every specialized area. Well, we certainly got a very um, detailed um, answer from you. And um, it's funny because a couple of your uh, competitors have actually declined to, to um, not answer the question so much, but they didn't want to give us their opinion um, because they, they were arguing they would have to recuse themselves if it's time to, to vote on the issue, which um, I found out in the meantime is not true. So I'm, I'm very happy that you talked about this because it is, definitely one of the hottest issues down here. Well, for better or worse, you ask me a question, you'll get my most honest answer. Sometimes that's a problem, but that's, that's the way I work. Well, that's what we would like on this forum. We would like to know who we're voting, who are we voting for, right? So you did good. So let me just jump to some questions that came up while you were talking about the great separation. Um, again, one is from Abby Bratsky. She would like to know, uh, what do you think about the lawsuit about opening Foothill Park? I would especially like to hear what you think the environmental impact might be to allow more people to use the park. So first, the, uh, the, uh, the council actually adopted measures to open the park on a moderate basis to non Palo Altans. Uh, my wife Sally and I uh, use that park about three days a week for the last 40 years, which I ended up calculating is about 6,000 visits. Um, did I do that math right? I think so. Um, and so we're really regular users. Uh, we actually had the park use decline over the last several decades gradually. Uh, and so when the Parks and Recreation Commission uh, made their recommendation, I ended up co-signing on as one of the community leaders supporting the recommendation of the partial opening. And I think it was a modest proposal and the right thing to do. Um, I think that if that's as much as it's open, the impacts will be nominal. And we actually have, uh, from a, a resource standpoint, we have volunteer groups, environmental volunteers and others who have said, we will step up, the city needs to engage with us and we will help 
uh, supply services uh, to, to do what's needed in the park to keep it that way. Um, so I think we can do that. Uh, this lawsuit, I think, is um, misguided. Um, first, it, it's acting as if the council took no action, but they did. Uh, one of the things they haven't done yet, and I've been pushing some council members for the last month or two, is that we had this on the books, this misdemeanor for illegal entry. And um, it was never enforced, but it was on the books, and it was a bad thing to have there to say, well, you can have an actual misdemeanor on you if you step into this park illegally or drive in. Uh, it should be, if, if anything, it should be an infraction, and that's it. And so they gave direction to have it uh, repealed, and uh, it hasn't come back to the staff yet. In the meantime, that's be being used as a, a way to just uh, criticize and accuse our, our community of, of uh, being um, exclusionary. And sadly, uh, these really unjustified accusations that uh, not opening it is somehow a racist in, uh, measure. I mean, those of us who go to Foothill Park know that it's a multi-ethnic participation right now. And everybody enjoys it. Our community uh, today is um, over 30% Asian. And that means that over the last 20 years, probably close to half of new homeowners in Palo Alto are, are um, uh, people of color. And, um, and that these accusations are wrong. And when the park was purchased, it wasn't because Palo Alto didn't want to share it with um, other surrounding communities is because Los Altos and Los Altos Hills, highly affluent and more exclusive and less diverse than Palo Alto, wouldn't share in the cost. And so Palo Alto uh, funded it themselves and said, well, at that time we didn't have open space districts. And they said, then if, if you won't help, then we'll just use it for our residents. In my mind, we've paid for that two times over, two different 30-year amortizations. We've gotten our money's worth. We want to protect uh, its condition. Um, and uh, at the same time, I think we can balance that with being open to our neighbors. I frankly, you know, I want to be, uh, have us be more inclusive. And I've always been very committed to relationships with, uh, with our neighbors. Uh, and in particular with East Palo Alto, I've had a great deal of involvement there. And I think this is one of an extension of that. Uh, and, and the historic injustices that uh, happen in East Palo Alto, starting with redlining and even um, various economic injustices and water rights and on top of everything else, we need to work together to really try to resolve those to the extent we can. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, let me jump to another question or another subject. We hear a lot about defunding the police. Do you think there is a need for <clears throat> reform in Palo Alto? Yes, um, but I don't think defunding is the right description uh, nor process per se. We may actually need in the short term to invest more in public safety, uh, not less. But there are reforms that are very important. So we did a number of reforms uh, from the time I went on council. Shortly after I went on council, we had evidence that our police chief was endorsing racial, racial profiling of drivers in Palo Alto. And we replaced the chief as a result and brought in uh, Chief Dennis Burns, who did a whole bunch of great reforms. And really, we saw what appeared to be good progress. It's always kind of tough to go behind that blue curtain of a police department and understand fully what's going on. But we put in um, body cameras and then cameras on vehicles and body cameras. We, uh, uh, Dennis brought in um, uh, uh, a police department pastor, Reverend Baines, who is a minister in East Palo Alto and who really built uh, relationships uh, and consciousness with, with the community um, and, um, and increased diversity training that we had. Now, in the last three years, we've seen some incidents that um, are really troubling. Um, and so even without those is incidents, there are best practices that are now recognized. And they are around first, as a foundation, this eight can't wait program, which is centered on uh, de-escalation and avoiding violence unnecessarily, to um, uh, have restrictions and limits on um, uh, potentially deadly use of force, and to have accountability so that um, bad misconduct of police gets exposed and there's an obligation to expose that so we can correct this. And those are the foundations of Eight Can't Wait. 
But that is the foundation. There, the other elements of what can be done is that we have many emergency calls that are for mental health services, uh, for nonviolent mental health, for homelessness, for nonviolent domestic uh, disputes, and other really things that are more social issues that our system says we have to send uniformed officers with guns and badges who are trained for a, a specific set of responses. Now they get training, our, we have one of the better police departments in the whole region and we hear that from people in the police community outside of Palo Alto. So we've had some bad apples and incidents, but that is not a reflection on the entirety of the, of the department. So we need to do those next things of bringing in these other resources. Interestingly, I spoke with Charlie Cullen, I don't know, maybe Rachel would even know Charlie, who's a neighbor, who grew up in Palo Alto and who for a dozen years headed our dispatch center, Sergeant Cullen. Uh, Charlie and I knew each other very well because we shared the chain gang at Pali at the football games for, for years. And um, so I contacted him because he just um, retired from our department as heading uh, the, the uh, emergency center at UCSF. He's able to speak more candidly when he leaves the department. Same thing with uh, Dennis Burns. I had a meeting with him in the last year to say, Dennis, what's going on here? Tell me if you are concerned with some of these things we're hearing about. And I really wanted to get their insights and I trust these people. Uh, and I had the same conversation with Reverend Baines and with the head of the police union to try to understand what's the reality, not just the accusations. And what uh, Charlie explained to me is that this year, um, they tentatively had in the budget to uh, hire a mental health professional to supplement the police department and go out on those emergency assignment calls. The council never knew that was in the budget, got cut um, in the, um, it was a new position. And so they never even saw that it got cut from the budget because in addition, it's one of these things that is, we may have additional expenses in this downturn, even while uh, we have fewer dollars. And so adding a social service worker and a mental health professional to work with the police and there are different models on how, whether they're the lead or they supplement the police, but that's another set of really important things. Lastly, um, is that a lot of our efforts to reform practices are restricted because the police contract with the union has binding arbitration, not just for wages and benefits and working conditions, but for these rules. So our police manual has a bunch of, um, uh, should clauses in it rather than shall and requirements. We're requesting these things, we're not requiring them. And so we have to negotiate out the binding arbitration uh, rights for the police union to get the set of reforms. The city can't even en enact many of the reforms that they'd like to do. Uh, so that's an important part. We did that with fire a number of years ago and it was a battle uh, and we prevailed. So we're rapidly running out of time here, but I would like to pick up one more question from Freda Klaas. Um, how would you deal with a housing crisis now? That's probably a little bit too big of an issue. Maybe you can sort of narrow it down. And specifically, she would like to know, how would you deal with uh, the workers living in the RVs on El Camino? And um, yeah. So she's right. It is complex, but it's a really important one. And there are, there are several different measures we can take not only in the RVs, but the, the full range of housing. So on the RV issue, uh, Lydia Koo and Tom Du Bois brought forward a colleague's memo six or nine months ago uh, to set up RV sites with services. And the first uh, locations were thought to be the, the uh, uh, faith institutions, and they were interested. And then the pandemic, they, they shut down their churches and the access to the services. We were looking at the former... Los Altos Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is our biggest unused city-owned property down at the end of San Antonio Road. Most people don't even know we own it. And that, that's really the best long-term candidate site. But last Monday, they adopted the Ging Road site right by the baseball fields there. And they, it's a partnership with the county. And the county has funds to provide these services and things. What they needed was the land. So the deal is, and I had talked with uh, Supervisor Samidian on this a year ago, said, no, if you can find the land, uh, we can provide the services. So we just lease the land to them for a dollar a year. They're coming in and we're going to have 
bathroom services, laundry services, uh, and for those who need it, any uh, uh, liaisons for transitional on physical health and mental health, and then moving them to transitional housing. So where they've done this elsewhere, the county takes a turnover of the RV dwellers and accommodates, ends up moving most of them into transitional housing structures. And it's a really great program. So we need to leverage that. The balance of the housing is a combination of all income levels, low, moderate, or workforce, where we have our teachers and, 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 um, and nurses and, and uh, social workers and all those people who make up a real community. Uh, we've been evolving toward a community that is overwhelmingly, in a region that's overwhelmingly high income software engineers and executives. And how do you have a functioning society that's almost everybody does that? Um, so we have to really work to reestablish that balance. <laughs> so in 2018, as a result of the comp plan that we finished in 2017, the council actually adopted a housing incentive program, which was the most significant, far and away, the most significant housing zoning changes in decades. But it takes a while to percolate through. And we're now, you may have just seen, we're getting a whole series of housing projects. We still, though, <coughs> still only have a limited amount of dollars for the affordable housing. So the, the incoming, the council that was elected majority in 2017 that ran as pro-housing, they were really pro-development. They got in and they reversed what we did in 2016 of increasing the affordable housing impact fees. They reversed it. And not only did that cut our dollars for affordable housing from what we would have had, those are the fees that the county imposes on Stanford for their development. So it's twice as many dollars we lost. On top of that, we have the um, business tax, which a portion of that would be designated for this. So we could, through those measures, triple to quadruple our rate of affordable housing, but we also need to subsidize to a lesser degree that middle income housing, because that's the part that doesn't get built. So we incentivized, we upzone, and the trade-off is we could see along El Camino, housing developments at the density of these hotels that have been getting along El Camino. I also want to see the underlying zoning that is for office to be taken away from certain of those areas that we want to put housing. Right now, housing has to compete with more lucrative office development for the land. So we take away that zoning and then we do the same thing in portions of Stanford Research Park. It doesn't have to be anywhere near the majority of the research park, but that is far and away the most available land for housing. And Stanford's indicated some openness to this. And so uh, those are the ways that I think we can actually make major dents and have the balanced housing types, not just the high income housing, but the balance. Thank you very much. Uh, we're ending, we're actually approaching the end here. Um, it has become a little bit of a tradition to ask you if you could, uh, which of your competitors would you like to sit on the council with? Well, it's interesting. Um, I would say we haven't had a more moderate ba uh, balance in the council for some time. We've had two factions that have kind of been at war with each other. I lean toward the residentialist side, but in a, a more moderate way than some others. And I think the uh, candidates who are philosophically most similar are Greerstone and Ed Lowen. Um, I, I like a, a lot of what Lydia Ku has done as well. Um, and, um, and so they're probably the, the candidates that I'm uh, most philosophically aligned with. I'm also comfortable with, um, with I've always thought that we need uh, not one perspective on the council. So we have uh, some interesting uh, new candidates, some younger candidates, and um, they would bring a different perspective and, um, and, and bring some value. When I first ran, Yahweh Ye ran, and he was an unknown. He had grown up here, uh, but was an unknown, and he really ran to bring in um, the perspective of, of our Chinese community who had been underrepresented and a very important and growing part of our community. And he had that as a mission. And uh, Yahweh was a policy wonk and brought great things. And I adore him and, um, and uh, thought that he, he really made a great addition to the council. He was elected at 29 years old, but he was a serious guy. He was, uh, he was mature beyond his year, years. Uh, so, um, 
So I, I, it'll be an interesting election. Great. So I'd like to thank you for taking the time and give you one last minute to tell us all why we should vote for you and not the competitors. If you want to give us your little elevator speech and tell us where we can support you, maybe your website URL. Yep. So my, met, my website is patbert.org. Um, so please go there and request a lawn sign and, and uh, we'd certainly welcome your support because uh, we're not taking donations from any developers or the unions. And so we're relying on the residents. And let me tell you, you're outgunned and we're outgunned. Um, one of our competitors has taken $70,000 from big developers already. And uh, so it's hard uh, to compete that way. And we have to rely on the community as well as your involvement in signing up to blast emails to your friends and colleagues, because that I think is uh, incredibly impactful. Um, and a reason that I, I really think that I, it's not instead of competitors, but in addition, you're going to have up to four votes. You don't have to cast all of them. Uh, but the council really um, needs to have a better understanding of how to work the levers of government, how there are council members who are frustrated. They say, well, I, I, the city manager is not listening to me. And I coach them and try and say, well, here's how to do this. And, um, and it is a governing process. I came as a CEO from a company and people think that you can go and just transfer private sector executive experience and move it right into the public sector. There are two different worlds. We can learn from the public sector, or excuse me, the private sector and, and utilize a lot of those practices, but they're not one and the same. And learning how to legislate and govern and persuade colleagues and problem solve from the dais uh, is something that the council, uh, when they work best, this is uh, something they, they need to do better. And I think I can help the council as a whole be more effective. Pat, thank you very much for taking the time tonight and jumping from one <laughs> to the next meeting. Um, it was very informative and we wish you all the best for your campaign. Will you tell us who the candidate is? I have a hunch. Who is taking the 70,000? Uh, that's Greg Tanaka. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> well, thank that's you. 70,000 so far. Remember last time he ran, he accepted something like $40,000 after the election. Uh, that and, and in the last week that wasn't reported from the developers. And so the voters didn't even know it until after they had elected it. Pat, thank you very much. That was really, truly informative. I learned a lot. Um, great. Good luck on your campaign and have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs> That's care. great. And thanks for doing this. This is really, uh, you know, doing this as a, your kind of group. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, new. And I think it's been really effective and I've heard good things about it. So um, keep it up. It's great. Wow, we have a reputation. That's great. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you soon. Bye.